Have you ever wondered how successful architecture, engineering, and construction companies scale their business? Or have you ever wanted guidance on how to get more growth, wealth, and freedom from your AEC company? Well, then you are in luck. Hi, I'm Will Forat. And I'm Justin Nagel, and we're your podcast hosts. We interview successful AEC business leaders to learn how they use people, process, and technology to scale their businesses. So sit back and get ready to learn from the industry's best. This is Building Building Scale. Hey listeners, it's Will here. Our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. If you've ever listened to our show, then you know that the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. So if you suspect technology is your weak link, then book a call with us to see where we can help maximize your company's IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. Today's guest is a true visionary in the world of design, the founder of Studio, Studio K Creative, Karen Harrell. Originally from Amsterdam, Karen made Chicago her home over two decades ago. With a background in fashion design, her passion quickly expanded into interior design, leading her to lead, leave a significant mark at the 555 International by transforming its retail interiors into a celebrated hospitality design division. Karen's work includes the acclaimed Girl in the Goat restaurant, uh, has earned numerous awards and distinguished client lists. And in 2014, Karen founded Studio K Creative in Chicago's West Town, a multidisciplinary creative house that's redefining spaces across the nation. From her first Nobu hotel, Nobu hotel in Chicago to the vibrant Girl in the Goat LA, Karen's designs are known for their timeless appeal and unique blend of humor and elegance. With a commitment to authentic design and creating memorable experiences, Studio K partners with leading names in the hospitality and development sector. Karen's forward-thinking approach continues to drive the success of her firm, making her a sought-after designer and creative leader. And with all that said, Karen, welcome to the show. Wow. Thank you. That's crazy hearing that back. I get that frequently, and I'm like, I, I ask generally what, what should go there, and I kind of just piece it together. What I what I hear that's like, oh, this is awesome. So uh, I'll, I'll send that over to you or Alexis, and you can just <laughs> utilize that. All the Again, PR. AI help you there. with that, or you wrote it all it, yourself? Well, yes, we're technology-driven, so AI always helps us with things, <laughs> which I'm sure we will talk about more and more. But before that, how about you give us the story? Obviously, you've got a, a rich history in design. Um, tell us your origin story about it, and then tell us about Studio K. Sure. Um, so, like you mentioned, I came um, came to the U.S. Uh, many many years ago in '98. Actually, I was a fashion designer. I learned early on that that's not what I wanted to spend uh, my time with, as I felt it was more of a 2D job than a 3D job, and I really missed that kind of three dimensionality and Uh, working with more textures than just those that are used in fashion. I was able to kind of have a lucky shot that brought me to a company called 555, where I became the creative director for uh, over 13 years, uh, at which time I felt it was time to walk on my own two feet and focus more on the design. As with 555, we were also producing the elements that we would come up with, uh, which brought a whole other part to the business that I didn't always uh, find pleasant. That's me being politically <laughs> correct. Uh, so I want to just really focus on uh, on design and also by that time I built up a very solid client base and I want to just try it on my own. So in 2014, started Studio K with five designers uh, that were already working with me. Um, great thing is that I gave my old boss a uh, one year notice, which means that he's still a very good friend of mine. Because uh, I knew those five people were going to come with me because I was trained them and I had worked with them. So um, a year later, we started Studio K together, um, which is now 10 years ago, which is really timely for this podcast. Okay. And, Congratulations. Uh, and so, yeah, thank you. And so we've been. Uh, kind of expanding ever since. No, that's awesome. Let's talk about your 
one year uncoupling and, and how that went. Usually people, when they're going off on their own, don't say, hey, I'm going to give you a year because you got to get your shit together. Um, but apparently that was your 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 motto. So tell us about yeah. how that went. Well, I think I did the uncoupling before Gwyneth Paltrow made it famous. Um, <laughs> and it just it just has a lot to do with this respect I have for uh, my former boss, who's still a very close friend of mine, about the respect I had, have for that company and all the opportunities they allowed me. They really took a big chance on me uh, when I was this fashion designer with no knowledge of the interior design business. Um, and so first off, I felt they deserved that respect. Second off, I also felt it was just smart on my end because I could ramp up, uh, put all my ducks in a row before I actually had to jump ship. And we actually kind of separated our clients. Like we told our clients, we let them know what was happening. And with some clients, they really wanted me to stay on the job. And so that became kind of one of my first consulting deals while I started my own company. And it was just trying to get proof that I think while all of our careers grow and change and morph over the entire time that all of us work, it doesn't have to be adversarial. It doesn't have to be dramatic. It's, it's just a job and we're changing it. Right? And, uh, and so I think if you do it that way, then it actually can be a win-win at the end. And uh, actually my old boss and I had a drink after work last night and discuss the project that they're producing uh, as a manufacturer because again they're also a manufacturer and they're producing still projects that we designed so um, now 10 years later um, I prefer him as my friend and my boss which I hear from a lot of people that that's kind of how it goes uh, <laughs> but I'm just really happy that we could do it that way and at the end of the day those relationships are more important than the jobs behind them. I feel like lots of entrepreneurs would agree with you when it comes to I'd rather have a friend than a boss uh, just as yeah. the, the motto the entrepreneurial motto mm -hmm. yep so um, you started with five people um, yeah. talked about your growth and you told us in kind of the pre-interview kind of something unique you intentionally stayed at a certain size at a certain headcount. So tell us to what headcount you kind of got to and then why you decided to be intentional about your headcount. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I was really completely honest when I told you that because I yeah, am I intentionally love your now. <laughs> I am intentionally staying at this headcount where I'm at now, but I grew very fast. Uh, in the first few years, and I very and maybe other owners of small businesses have this as well. I was very driven by that amount and kind of the commentary you get from your peers around this as is it being a positive, right? Oh, you're starting with five people. Wow. Instead of it's just you on, you know, on your back room somewhere. And then later on, when they, when you announce that now you have 10 people, oh, wow, now you have 10 people. So there's this constant pat on the back in growth and growth being synonymous to success. And I definitely fell for that. And so growth happens and happens till before COVID, we were at 30 people. And I lost complete control over my manpower. I had around zero percent chance of designing all of those things myself or having any kind of influence on it and uh, and with that also i lost most of the joy in my job as my job had very quickly changed from a designer to lead designer to creative director to now uh, babysitter more or less like probably better names for it but most of my days were filled with figuring out why someone wanted to work or not wanted to work and at which hours and from which location and all these things that um don't come natural to me and uh, so covid uh popped that balloon a little bit for obvious reasons and it also gave us kind of a chance to clean house a bit and really became become really mindful um, what I really wanted to do. So I had a moment where I was very close to 
I don't know, giving up is a word, but kind of just leaving it. It's kind of like when you play a board game as a small kid and you feel you're losing and you just want to throw the whole board upside down. You're like, I'm done. Uh, I had a little bit of that. that. I, I have saying, a four-year-old and that happens uh, often enough that I, I know that yeah. feeling very, very, very You busy. know that. You're like, oh, I'm going to lose. I'm not going to this bedtime. Um, so I made many jokes, but not really that funny jokes about quitting and starting a juice bar in California, because that seemed much less stressful than running 30 people and their uh, wellness. Oh, um, instead of doing that, I decided I'm going to give it one uh, one other very honest try. I'm going to roll up my sleeves, but in this case, I'm going to do it exactly the way I want to do it and be very mindful about who I want to do it with and be very clear on the culture that is the culture I want to create. And if that doesn't fit with others, then you know, kind of have an open door policy as in uh, out. And I just became very clear on that, on what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it, and which landed me um, at an amount of 20 people that with 20 people and the jobs that we need to produce to keep those salaries going, I can still have a full oversight of every single job, every fabric, every chair, every light bulb, every crowd color in any of those jobs. Um, which makes me feel much better about the work we pump out. And also I am able to create a very personal relationship with each of those 20 people, which is um, much harder at 30 or above. Yeah, I think I agree with you. When when people think about, oh, I started a business. Oh, I started with five people. Okay, so you're already ahead of the curve. And then you go up 30, 40, 50, what, you, know, you get up to these these heights and it's like very celebrated. But for you internally, if you're not having fun anymore, then what does the number matter? Like, it's great. Yeah. I got well, 50 people, but I'm not, I'm no longer happy. And it's like, why yes. did I, why did I go become an entrepreneur? And why did I go off on my own if I was just going to do it to then just be unhappy? Like, that, it's more stressful. Exactly. It's got all the other things that just entrepreneurship does. And then on top of it, like, I'm no, also not happy. Like, that's foolish. Thank and I'll so throw smart one on other you. thing in it. The profit went down dramatically mm. as well. Because by that time, it's so hard to have oversight and there's so much more production and production people. And if they're not being managed correctly, there's um, there's a saying in Dutch and it says mopping with the faucet running. And that's kind of, that's kind of what's happening. So you keep like spinning your wheels and you're evolving. Everyone's super duper busy. And meanwhile, uh, much less is being produced with those 30 than when we were with 20. Because uh, kind of the cohesion is gone. So in my case, um, figuring that out. And then on top of that, I recently, it's interesting, I just met with an architect that uh, became a friend of mine during working together. And uh, he flew in for something in Chicago. He's from Manhattan Beach. And he came here to see me. And I said, so James, how many people you have now? He says, five. I'm like, oh, and I had that same admiration for him now saying five as if I would have had 10 years ago when someone said 50, because now that seems, you know, like in the beginning we have career, you're happy when people call you and you're very needed and you get like a hundred emails and then, you know, 25 years in, you're really happy if you're not the one being emailed anymore. So there's also kind of a natural, I think, um, maturing in uh, being an entrepreneur and kind of how you measure success and how you measure that for yourself versus how you think it's being measured by others in the industry. So, you know, since we're talking about entrepreneurial life, entrepreneurial life is, there's a lot about adapting to constant change. Um, and so, you know, failure, innovation, right? All those things. Um, as entrepreneurs, we start getting sort of resistant or resilient to sort of that failure and that constant change. We start thriving in that change. Well, most people don't like change. So how do your people accept that this is sort of the norm of uh, you know, constant change. Good one. I'm not sure all of them do. However, 
However, I do feel that designers by nature embrace change as long as they're part of creating that change. Mm -hmm. So I think the invite of sitting at the table of changers, change makers, is a very different position than watching other people create a change. So I think w one really important thing that we do is we're a very inclusive company, mm -hmm. a very horizontal structure. I'm meeting pretty much with every single designer. So them being a voice of that change, I think is really important. Uh, and I also think that there's ways to create structure while changing. And so I think when people feel safe in the structure and they understand the way we embrace change, the way we deal with it and explaining why that change is important, then for most you can get buy-in. The people that are less likely to go along with that are, are people that we have in a different side of our business, the, the kind of the second part of our design process where design development, construction admin happens, all the detailing, and they tend to be much more happy in that part of our world than the part where I spend most of my time in, which is concept and schematic, which it's a constant Highly creative. Change. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's high, the, the high creatives. Um, yeah. so that's like at the beginning of the, so at the beginning of the project is where you thrive and you have a set of people that are sort of similar in that high creative, low de quote unquote, low detail. Right. Uh, yeah. and then, and then you've got sort of a transition that happens where, you know, once you're past that creative process, you are now, uh, you have a different set of people that don't like sort of the chaos or creative process as much. And they're more looking to focus on sort of the execution side, right? Uh, I think yes. you had said previously a more pragmatic requires a more pragmatic brain. I think is what you mm -hmm. said. Yeah. Um, and they like to just drive things forward to a closed conclusion versus all the options that the team in the beginning does. And there's a significant overlay between those two uh, teams and there's two sides of our business and that happens typically after schematic approval we do everything in 3d so the moment our clients approve our full 3d renderings is when that that kind of transition happens um so there's there's a significant part where both teams are collaborating it's it's almost like a relay race right it's one person starts running and there's a while away where that stick is passed on and then the other keeps running. That also means that the other part of the beginning team is also able to take on a new job and really dive into all their creativity again, which I've learned in the past where when we didn't do it that way, we had designers that needed to be on new jobs, but they're so bogged down with all those last nitty gritties and all this detail and then VE happens. So then, you know, you lose a lot of hours in that and repicking and reselecting so many things. So we noticed that that last 2% of closing a project uh, is very difficult for that other group of people, that front running team to close that last 2% this close to impossible with those mindsets because there's always new options and there's always other colors to choose from. Uh, but the good ones is the ones at the end, that team, they don't let us do that. They just want to answer by five and it's the final answer. <laughs> <laughs> putting more parameters around, uh, hey, we need, we just need to get this going. No, that's, yeah. that's, that makes yeah. sense. Um, those so, are two unique minds. Those are very two unique minds. How do you uh, nurture a, a culture with having two very distinct profiles of mindset? Well, one thing that helps is I am a split between those two. So I'm, I am uh, raised by uh, an architect uh, that turned artist. And, and my mom is also an artist. So I'm very much raised in a highly creative artist family. However, both of them German. 
So oh, oh, oh. <laughs> German engineering, high detail. There you go. And and so I am on on both sides. I enjoy both sides um, equally, and I've also learned that one side with the, uh, out the other kind of doesn't cut it, right? So if you have all that engineering, but you would create the same thing someone else would have already created, uh, there's very little sense to that. However, if you have all this creation, all these ideas, but you can't figure out how to execute um, those ideas, then there's also nothing. So you need both of them. We do a tremendous amount of retreats and uh, enneagrams. I think we talked about last time. So we mm -hmm. figure out how, what is the strength of each person? Therefore, how and where do they fit best? We many times do that as an 80-20 because most people are not something always, all the time. Most people have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So we see where they fit best. We give them opportunities to grow and learn in the other, let's call them weaker, quote unquote, section if they so choose to. There are certain people are like, no, I will never, ever want to get in front of schematic, which is great too. Um, so we very much build our teams around people's strength and their personalities. And turns out a lot of times the culture works because of the, those opposites, because like in other parts in our life, when it's not career opposites attract a lot of times, uh, and those people can actually really work well together because they don't step on each other's toes. They don't have opinions about the same things, right? And where the highly creative person wants to drive that further. Uh, the more pragmatic person helps that high creative to maybe get their scheduling in order and maybe hit those answers a little sooner than they might want to. So I think from a culture, it actually really works having those opposites because um, typically that front end kind of people comes with a lot of uh, a little louder, maybe a little more outspoken. We get crazy cool outfits because of that. We get uh, hilarious moments. But then, you know, there need to be audiences for those more dramatic people. And many times the more pragmatic group of them are winning participants as a uh, audience member and, you know, take a little bit of the back seat at the lunch table maybe. So I think it's a good, it's a really good mix of people. Oh, yeah. So just to clarify, because I'm a big fan. So for those of, those of our listeners that don't know what it is, Enneagram is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, sort of profile, uh, personality kind of tests, uh, scaled one through nine, um, talks about sort of each personality sort of represent, you can you have like 27 essentially sub personalities under those nine main personalities. Um, no one is 100%, like you said, no one is 100% one of those personalities, but you sometimes wing, you know, different, different ways. So do you know what your, uh, like what your n number uh, and wing is, uh, do you remember? It's okay. If, if, it's okay. If, if you, you don't, know, uh, like, you know, it's really bad because you guys told me to do my homework and know that by now. And I don't. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's okay. It, it's I, okay. I didn't want to put you on the spot. Um, so I know, for example, I'm a five, uh, five wing six. Okay. I know sixes, for example. Um, so five is sort of the core of my personality. And then, uh, you can wing to either four or six. So, um, five are, fives are considered sort of the, we'll call them the, the philosophers, uh, the, the thinkers. Um, but then, the six is, um, those are the ones that are constantly looking at, those are the monkeys that are the like warning everyone. Those are the people at the oh. back of the, the engineers that are warning at the back of the room going, Hey, mm -hmm. I'm not sure it works that way. Six is the ones. might fall off of the plane. Yes, exactly. Yes. Those are the, <laughs> those are sixes talking. Uh, if they're, if, uh, if they're the ones that keep raising their hand about, I'm not sure that it works uh, the way you think it does or et cetera. So those are sixes. Fours on the other hand. Do you hand. have the list? Yeah, um, you have the I, list in front of you, or you just know. I don't by actually. Art? I'm doing this from I'm doing this from memory. Uh, wow. Fours are more. Uh, they're um, so let's see here. If I remember correctly, fours are. Um, I think it's gut based, but, and it's to do 
I remember what the negative side is. I don't remember what the what the positive side. The the negative side is they're considered like the emo, uh, the really emo people. Um, uh, where like the world is sad, you know, everything in my world is sad, etc. Et I don't. I remember the negative side. So uh, in the enneagram, there's essentially three types. So it's either your gut reaction is anger, your gut reaction is fear, or your gut reaction is shame. Okay, so those are the negative side, and I'm I don't remember what the what the positives are. So <laughs> uh, uh, it's it's the easiest way to tell sort of which set of numbers you are if it's heart, gut, uh, or as I think head. Um, head is fear, gut is um, I think gut is anger, and then uh, heart is shame uh, or shame. I think is what what it is. So um fear the fear-based ones are five six seven um the anger ones are eight nine one and then the shame ones are two three four shoot now I Man, well, you're giving us a full was... lesson on the uh Enneagram. <laughs> yeah so we did this we did this a, a while ago in our company and it was super interesting we had a couple of people that were like almost exactly like identical even how they wing and so mm -hmm. they were able to sort of teach each other uh, some of the things that they've learned. So being self-aware, I like the whole concept of being self-aware on tendencies, et cetera, because then by being self-aware, um, you're digging whatever the viewpoint of your inside is on the out and the outside in your aligning. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and this, and so I like what you were talking about, which is the team side of you where it's okay to actually have different people and the different opinions because knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses, you can fill the gap in those, but you yeah. have to be highly aware and you have to, this is where the team dynamics come in. Yeah, uh, and we, we are actually about to do a refresher in our summer camp in July, uh, which new people we got on board and a refresher for people like me who don't remember things like that. Um, because not only do I think it's workable, I think it actually really helps. Like in our case, having all these different, and it's not just the Enneagram, there's different, uh, very similar type of tests that we have been do doing. Also, Colby. like in how you address, say that again? Was it Colby or Myers-Briggs or something like that? There's a whole bunch of personality uh, so profiles. Many, and this wasn't a personality, this was about how you solve problems. And oh, so okay. this was about like, there's a group of people that would be called the, they're inquisitive. Is that the way to say it? Yeah. And, questioning. Uh, mm -hmm. They're questioning. There's other people who dive right in. There's other people who just start sketching for them. So there's all these different ways of how people uh, address a problem or a challenge. And once you figure out what people, how people act uh, in those situations, you can make sure that you can, I always compare our team to a varsity soccer team. And so when you compare to soccer, you need a striker and you need a goalie, right? You cannot just have a team of strikers. Like, although it's great, some people need to defend somewhere too. And so I see that with our office, like you need, and every single one is as important but you cannot just keep hammering on that one person or creating multitudes of that role um, because you'll get weak spots within the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've found some magic in creating teams so that they balance each other out. You're somewhere inserted into part of that balance. Uh, you get to sort of oversee that balance. Yeah, oh. I lead. I kind of lead both of those teams through their process. That is super cool. As uh, that's a different way of being involved in leadership. I really like it. So when you at some point, we, I'd love to know what the enneagram is. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get it in July, Will. I swear we will. Yeah, um, and it's still the same. You... It better be the same. Oh, it is. Other, you're, you're otherwise, set there's a lot 12. of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at around the um, age of 12 is where it gets set. Unless you have a like huge trauma, your Enneagram okay. does not really change. Um, when you well, do you have give me new people, 
like new staff, new designers that come on. Mm -hmm. Are you, are, are you looking for them to be more experienced? Or are you looking for them to be less experienced because of the environment that you're kind of building is a little bit more unique? Um, there's a tough one. I've, I've said on both sides of the, uh, opinion over the years. Uh, I have learned that right out of school is very tough unless they had an internship with us. And so we've been really lucky with crazy good interns that more or less became needed. Like we'd be sad when they have to go back to school and we're like, okay, go get that degree real quick and then please come back. So we have had that multiple times and these people make very fast careers within this company. Besides that, we steer away from hiring people right out of school. We are, like I said earlier, a varsity team, um, not a club team. And I think a lot of people don't realize what that means. They they like the idea of it and they hear the, the names and the nobus of the world or, or go and go, whatever the names are that they're drawn to. But not everyone is willing to walk the walk, you know? So they hear it and they're like, ah, yeah, and I'm so this and this and I love to work and I don't care about Many times that is different once they're in the environment, and especially if they're new to the working environment, it's we're an extremely demanding company. And so it's not, it's definitely not for everyone. Uh, so we steer away from that. For people who are a little bit further in their career, we de have definitely learned, and that was kind of my learning during COVID, where I really start enjoying having a more mature group of people around us. Uh, that can work more independent, that has already kind of landed on where they want to be. On what side of it? I think a lot of young designers, they all think they want to do concept. They all think they want to do schematic because that's kind of the front of the camera work, right? They think that's where the glory is. Um, the longer many people are in their process, you start learning that we're actually was it the rubber meets the road, is on that second part, right? Where you really know if someone can design furniture and can design custom writing and is technically knowledge about code and many of the technical things that we need to know to create an actual great space versus a actual great Pinterest board. And that's a very different um, know-how. And so what I really enjoy in this, this more mature group of people that we have is that acknowledgement of people when they've gone through that process and then maybe later on in their 20s or early 30s start realizing, hey, actually it feels really good in the management of projects or the construction administration. These things that many people don't think when they're 22 and coming out of school that that's an interesting job. So it it helps us if we if people already know a little bit more about the industry and therefore their role within it where their passion is and i think most people in the first couple of years are still finding that out well, yeah that, this is this is know thyself awareness <laughs> this is exactly what it is yeah very very pointed no absolutely uh, it's one of the things that is also unique is you've niched down right you've historically done lots of different uh, types of uh, design like that. I mean, even fashion separately, like not even that. <laughs> You've done lots of different design just as in design work in an architectural kind of a way, um, interior designs. Why niche down into that hospitality? Why go there and, and kind of live there? Yeah, it kind of came in the beginning. It was coincidental when all the work uh, early in my career, when I was still at 555, we ended up doing a tremendous amount of work in Vegas with Steve Wynn at his hotel with, at that point, George Malou, who owned the Palms, Hugh Hefner, who owned Playboy. There was a lot of that kind of hospitality, like big driving clubs and Vegas over the top work. So it was very early in my career where that started. We also did a tremendous amount of retail, uh, which for me, retail is so much more on that pragmatic side than on the emotional side of things, where on the hospitality side, the emotional driven design, which is really where my passion is. 
um, just has much more space to grow and to explore than in retail per se. And over the years, although we still do a lot of high-end residential, what I learn every single time is where my personal passion lays is to create spaces that can change how people feel. So that experience design, although that's such a buzzword, and I think there's entire departments now in companies that are called that, and there's titles that are called that. To me, it's like, it's everything. Like someone once asked me in an interview, like we were talking about hospitality design versus other design, like let's call it multifamily or retail. If you really think about it, every single thing is hospitality design. It's all hospitality because no matter who we are, we're all serving someone, a guest, a client, a, a living human being that needs to feel welcome, which really is hospitality. So every single thing is hospitality design in my mind, and everything is driven by experience. My main personal goal is to make a, an actual change with design, which is way past finishes or colors or whatever, wallpapers, but it's creating something that I'm convinced that we can create change in people by the spaces we put them in. And a very, very simple example is put someone in a conference room with a neon light over them or a fluorescent light bulb, even better. And, and have a conversation versus take that same person in a bar with a nice mood lighting and have the exact same conversation. That's almost impossible because it's a whole different environment which changes how we feel and therefore changes the course of things. So that drives me. Um, and then in addition to that, my main drive when I wrote my mission stated, statement starting to be okay Everyone thought it was a joke, but I was actually very serious about it. And they're like, what's your mission statement? I'm like, well, my company, I just want to do really cool stuff with um, really great people. And they were like, well, that's not a mission statement. Like, okay, that's a wait, great let mission me make statement, it. if you ask me. I'll make no more formal. I'm like, okay, I will do, uh, I will work with people that I know, for people that I respect, on projects that I find challenging, with people that I like. And that's where I landed. That's my formal uh, mission statement. And uh, after 10 years, it's as valid as ever, where there's um, certain people I just enjoy working with. And many entrepreneurs that are in that hospitality space are uh, very interesting people to get to know and um, that to spend time with. And many of them become my friends. And um and so I enjoy being in that space with those people who have big dreams and they want to create hotels or crazy restaurants or better yet, big resorts in ski areas. Uh, so that's where I, <laughs> that's where I kind of go. I go where the cool people go. So I'm jealous uh, that that's, you get to go where the cool people are or cool, cool people go. Like that's Just like that's, your mission state. Change your mission yeah, oh, state. Dude, it's nice. <laughs> Right, right now. But people say that, like, I'm jealous of your mission change, or I'm jealous that you do and I think you should do it too, because we can all do it. We just need to decide what we want to spend our time with and who we want to spend it with. And as much as any entrepreneur's work, um, not about knowing about you guys, but I work the majority of my life. And um, so I want to do that with uh, fun people. I like, uh, I really like, uh, I like the mission statement. Okay. Uh, there's something that's brewing in the back of my mind. I'll figure out what I'm trying to actually uh, say in a bit. So, not to, so that way we don't pull up the clock. Um, I want to ask you some other things. So, can you compare working with the part of the reason? I think we talked a little bit about this in the pre interview. Why you work with sort of cool people and how you found your superpower? Um, you essentially the opposite. Did not attract you. So, large corporations. Um, can you talk about? I think you had some experiences or something like that. But what was it that you didn't like about essentially the opposite, right? And yeah. it's a great way of kind of figuring out your niche as well as by realizing what, what you don't like. Is, yeah, what you don't like. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's interesting because the reason or one of the main uh, things that allowed me to start my company in a very successful way was um, meeting an amazing guy who was the creative director at McDonald's at the time who asked me to work with him on a global new concept. Uh, I haven't worked with him in years, yet he is a very close friend of mine now, and he has moved on to Chipotle now, and um, we just get together and we live close to our practical neighbors. And um, and he was one of these guys that brought me for the first time in a big corporate structure. And I didn't realize because of just the personality he has how after he left most, and this is not to discredit any larger corporate structures because they're great and they're for a reason, but they don't necessarily are designed to give way to crazy creativity of an individual. They're built on systems. They're built on departments. They're built on checks and balances and on a lot of justifying why things are done a certain way and hedging on those ways of why and if not, then. And the problem with design, an inherent thing in my opinion in design is that it needs to be authentic and it needs to be an authentic singular vision to live its fullest expression. So if in any other field, we acknowledge that, like we'll never see two conductors leading one orchestra. It's like, it's not a thing. Seems complicated. We never see two chefs in the same kitchen, right? So in so many other worlds that are creative, we have all acknowledged and seen that there is one director or creative, however you want to see it, so once you start working for these larger corporations, they have someone in charge to run the creativity. However, they go to another company to then execute on it. And my thought is that that's where it goes wrong. Like if you have a very strong creative director, then or get a company to implement those, whatever it is, um, or then step out of the way and go after a high creative company to then lead it. That doesn't typically work. So the moment you start working for the larger corporations, it becomes a watered down version of something. And it becomes over weeks of check-ins. Like they, many of these companies require every week to show your status report type of thing. And so that means, and, and, I might have shared that story with you guys about McDonald's, about how I always compare designing and cooking and how with McDonald's, I had to present way earlier than I was ready for, but there was a big exec in from Poland at the time. And I told this group of executives, there must have been 20 people in the room, that I was going to present this, but that I compared designing to cooking and that you need to have a chef let them do the work and you cannot just come in the kitchen midway and say, hey, what does it taste like now? And then you're going to judge what you're going to eat based on whenever you decided to walk in the kitchen. And I said, well, especially if you think about making chicken, you would come midway and the chicken isn't cooked. That could be very risky. That could cost you your life. So if you want to see what I'm cooking now, I just want to make sure you understand you're entering at your own risk. This is not done and it's not fully cooked. So I presented the work and uh, after I was done, that guy said, I'm not sure what you're cooking, but I like the smell of your chicken. <laughs> and uh, that's how I knew it was approved. Um, so the hard part over time and when I um, entered in these larger corporate structures, it, it, be, it becomes so many things that are not design they are maybe a version of it but not the type of design that i want to do and it's also if you think about proportions with most like i work for a chef which i kind of call myself the chef whisperer and it's by far one of my favorite things to do in the world is just making sure that the chef walks in and be like this is exactly what i had in mind and i didn't even know what i had in mind but it was exactly this that's kind of my end goal with all of those projects that feeling of just 
creating an environment that reflects their personality and their food exactly the way it should and be kind of the backdrop for their story, like a set designer for a movie. I I just want to be that set designer for those people. And in a restaurant job, you can almost see it like 70% of our time we spend on design and creativity and 30% we spend on management of the project. When you get into these larger corporate deals, 20%, maybe 10% is the creativity creative part 90 percent are oac calls and making sure that every key stakeholder also is in alignment and so there there, there's reasons for it i just don't think i'm necessarily the best partner for them especially because all of what i do is based 100 can't say 100 99% on intuition. And if you work with your gut and your intuition, that is a really hard thing to sell upstream in a corporate structure. Like no one can go to the CEO and say, we're going to do this and this and this because Karen's intuition said it was a good idea. (laughs) That will never do good on the slideshow. So that means that although I know the answer from day one, I need to go backwards and present it in a way that they can sell it upstream. Which you it's know like we do. Knowing and we the math them. in your head, but yeah. having to show your work after you're like I already knew yeah. the answer, but I have yeah. to show my work now. <laughs> exactly, and the spending of that time. It's not about show showing that, and I'm actually very much in the process of trying to figure out a way to really explain how it works and how I can teach other people to work the same way. It just, if we spend most of our time on doing that, it's just for me, not a, uh, the best use of my time. Makes sense. That totally makes sense. Uh, AI might be able to help with that given the right prompts. Mm. Oh yeah. Just, just Good. Ah. Point that out. I like that idea. Uh, but Neither here nor there. Uh, actually, you know what? This might be a good segue to talk about talk about that for a second. Um, you've played a little bit with yeah. AI. Why don't you talk a, a little bit about your experiences, uh, what you think about sort of uh, as we are entering the age of AI. Talk about yeah. what you've discovered so far and where your journey has taken you. So I love change and I love progress. I embrace it. I am kind of slow personally with it. I'm not a tech wizard. I spend most of my time in meetings, not on computers. So I, I, my big dream is to go to Colorado, lock myself up in my barn and uh, disconnect all internet, except those that I need for my AI experiences. And like Mm -hmm. my big goal, and I have it open on all of my, on my tap on my iPad, tap on my MacBook, have a tap open of whatever is the latest and greatest that I should look into. And if someone emails me and it's open for that moment that I think I'm going to have to tinker with it. Uh, I'm afraid that by the time that I actually do that, there will be not new software (laughs) that is way further. Uh, So I don't know technically too much about it. What I do know is that it's undeniable and it's almost like as if we said many years ago, ah, I don't know about those self bad for us. We should have real conversations with real people. Like I feel these people that are these naysayers and that like reluctancy is like, no, yeah, we need to figure it out and we need to make sure that there's guardrails and that it's not being too abused. Uh, but I do think if we're smart about it, we can you know, use it in our advantage. And I don't think it's a replacement like a phone conversation is not to a real conversation or many thousand other examples we can name. So how we have recently used that, which was an extremely fun experience. I worked with a consultant to do this is he created all the AI for us. And instead of going to Pinterest, which is kind of the main uh, software that so many designers use and don't even use as inspiration that many times just flat out copies, kind of like a collecting tool, like this wallpaper and then the chair from this image and the ceiling from that image, and then kind of put them in one bowl, which many times I compare to flat top grill, like just because you're allowed to put it on a bowl, that remains a good idea necessarily. So with designing, 
I think a lot of times th- that like additive type of way is not necessarily the right way, and it lets gives way too much um, power to those images that just happen to be by your eyes. So my prompt for our designers is always, you have to be able to explain this to a blind person. So mm. um, explain, it. use your words. And if someone cannot see, explain how they're going to feel and why it is they're going to feel that way and what are the elements that you've put in place to make them feel that way. So the way, if if you are being trained to express yourself without visuals, then that means you can use that expression to inform AI. And what is then interesting is that what is then coming back as a visual image is something that actually has never been done before, except by this AI tool that use all the prompts that I gave uh, to create something that is, yeah, an iteration of all these things that are out there and my words that informed it, but it's not an existing restaurant that is, you know, was published last week and therefore everyone is repinning the same uh, idea. So what I really liked about it is that we got really fresh content, that it was very much in line with the prompts that um, I've been given. And uh, or I gave uh, the AI guy, and and so it became actually a very uh, interesting way of working and kind of overriding uh, Pinterest. Which nothing against Pinterest because it's definitely a lifeline for many designers, but I think designers using it in the wrong way. And instead of them being in charge, like I, when I use it personally, I would say I need an image of burnt wood. And then I'll go on Pinterest. Like I use it more like Google Images, where I just say, "Hey, this is what I'm, what I need. Give me an image of that." And then many times on Pinterest, those images are of a higher quality than in Google Images. However, if people just start scrolling, like, "Oh, this open. Oh, this is pink. Oh, wait, now I get ten other pink interiors," and mm-hmm. just leads you to this. So um, that's how we've used it, and uh, I find it fascinating, and uh, I see us using it a lot more that way. It is interesting to think that because you're cre- you know, it's creating a unique, right, in comparison to looking through a list of great mid-century designed restaurants that <laughs> have a lot of ideas that could go in different directions, but if you're just taking, like, the snapshot of, like, oh, bam, this is what that looks like. And this is the feeling I want. It's like, well, that feeling somebody else created, like that was somebody else's art effectively in comparison to, hey, I really want a dark wallpaper that has ducks riding a unicorn. Like that is unique. And that's something that you can't find on Pinterest watch. I bet you that's a thing Mm -hmm. on Pinterest. But like the, (laughs) the thing is like, that's, such a more unique way to say like this is the feeling i want and so i can yeah. i can prompt it to give you something that is very very much t- tailored to what you're looking for and it's hard it's hard not everybody it, can not everybody can paint that or never not everybody can draw that out like that's a yeah that's not something that everybody can do but if you can have a tool that allows you to take your idea and make it into something more con- constructive uh yeah that's and, and especially if you then still, I still, still the caveat that it is still instead of a Pinterest image. So it's still just to show it to the client mm-hmm. to say, hey, with all those words that I was saying, this is what I meant. Because like all of us know, when we read a book and all three of us would read the exact same book, we'll have a whole different Pinterest image, right? Or AI image in right. our head. And then when someone makes the movie, you're like, no, but that's not what the guy looks like. Like, where are he is in that yeah. actor? So I think it's a really helpful tool for our clients to get aligned in. So when I meant sexy, mod, but crazy, wild, then that's kind of what that meant for me, because that could be something else for someone else. So that way, I think it really works. And then especially if we're all stay aware of that that's when the design process starts. And this is not when DD starts, which again, certain people will take that image and then start drawing that in cat. Like, no, that's not what we're doing. But now we're all aligned of which way our 
faces are pointing at, and then we can start designing, which that's when it gets fun. Oh, absolutely. I, um, I, now I'm really intrigued about this duck unicorn idea. I got yeah. my brain. Um, and when you, for when you find it, please send it to me because I might I, be I'm able going to use to, it. Or I'm going to create it in, in AI and then I'll send it to you. Um, uh, we, we've got one last question. So Will, uh, from one uh, crazy visionary to another, uh, let, let's see let's see what we got here. Okay. So if you were to go back 20 years, so that's 2004, what would you tell yourself? What would you, what would you want to have told yourself? It will all happen exactly the way it should happen. I like that's it. That's pretty much it. I, yeah. I, uh, I really... Yeah, I wish I would have had a little less fear, but then the fear drove me. So I really, maybe it's a, I'm going to answer this with a, a random kind of, it's not random, but a, a story that I tell many young people, uh, because maybe that answers the question in a more creative way. So my philosophy, which I have a lot of philosophies, <laughs> one of my philosophies is that Life is pretty much like that game that we played in the back of the car on a road trip, where there's all these dots and you connect them. And the way mm -hmm. I talk about that is between 20 and 30, all you need to do is put the dots. It doesn't matter. Just put the dots. Find people that allow you to put dots. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about how much money you're going to make there. Is it exactly the right job? Or is it just put dots? Just dots, dots, dots. Then right around 30, for most people, you start connecting these dots. And so you make these connections. And, like, and then right around 40, you're like, ah, that's a giraffe. And then all we need to do is finish the giraffe. But that is kind of a big picture. And everyone has a different path. And these dates are not exact. But I think the, the years of 20 and 30 in that time, for most people, right? We don't have families yet, many of us, and we don't have that much restrictions and we're freer to move around. And I just recommend all these people come to me and I pick my brain and what should I do? The only thing you shouldn't do is sit on the couch and wait for someone to call, to call you or spend all the time online and figure out what other people are doing. Don't ever look at what other people are doing. Just do, do. Just do and go and talk and meet. And without a, a specific need for an outcome, just knowing that all of it are these dots. And it's somewhere in most around, for people around your 30s, you have so many dots. And if you're connecting them, then something starts really to make sense out of all those dots. And you start realizing, oh my gosh, like I've done jobs in my 20s. And like, why am I doing it? And then now I'm like, oh, that's so great I did it then because I learned so much from that job. And now that experience comes in handy, right? And then what, what I believe is then if you keep doing it and you're paying your dues and you're working hard and you're actually learning your craft, whatever that craft might be, then right on 40, you can start sinking in that a little bit because now you know it's a giraffe, right? So you're not that worried about what that animal is going to be. Hopefully you're happy with that giraffe. But then you can start finishing it and then it actually becomes fun because now the fear is mostly gone. Uh, and then you can start playing and then you can start playing with other peers and maybe you, you decorate your giraffe a little different than they had in mind in the book. So that's kind of my philosophy. So going back on like what, what I wish I would have known, maybe a little bit of that, less of that fear and that, that drive that I had so strong in my 100 hour weeks, you know, for 10 consecutive years. Uh, but then again, I, that's where I laid the groundwork. That's when all these dots were put on the paper. So I kind of needed that. Sometimes you cannot know the answers to that touch yet. I do find it um, very fitting that <clears throat> it's advice that you give younger people, which is inherently, you know, you 20 years ago was a younger person. So that's a very sure. fitting, uh, very, yeah. very fitting that that would be it. Well, awesome. I love, this the, has been love the answer. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. We, so we're going to throw all your social links and all that stuff in the show notes. Uh, but if uh, if somebody wanted to get hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, it's on our website. My email's there. We're all fairly transparent on what we do and where we do it. So not a hard person to find. Okay. No, uh, sounds good. And is there anything else you'd like to tell the people before we go? 
No, well, except from a shout out to you guys because um, I started uh, listening to all of your podcasts. It has been it's a great pleasure for me personally. I already learned so much in my uh, daily commutes uh, that I actually look forward to my drive now. So I hope that oh. everyone follow my wow. lead and uh, make Thank you. make make you got you guys are driving with me back and forth to the burps almost on the daily so uh, thank you for that thank you well, that's amazing thank we'd you. love to hear that um, i got and goosebumps really appreciate th- 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 hearing that so thank you so much i love hearing when we're impactful to someone out there absolutely well thank you for guys. sure uh, this has been a blast i i learned a bunch i've thought about things i haven't ever thought about before We've had, we have a lot of smiling uh, going on in, the, in this uh, meeting here. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping you listeners have had just as good of a time. And until next time, adios. Adios. Thanks for listening to Building Scale. To help us reach even more people, please share this episode with a friend, a colleague, or on social media. Remember, the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. And our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. So if you think your company's technology pillar could use some improvement, book a call with us to see how we can help maximize your IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. And until next time, keep keep building building scale. scale.